Hello everyone and welcome back to Nintendo Everything Refresh episode 12. This is the official podcast of NintendoEverything.com where we refresh your memory on what is new and exciting in the world of Nintendo. We have an extra special episode this week. It is the Not Quite E3 special episode. Woo! Yay! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> we we, there's way more to talk about than we could ever cram into one episode, um, but before we get into everything, uh, all the games that we have to talk about, uh, we have got Nicholas Shade here. Hello, everyone. We've got Dennis Gagliardato. Hello, hello. And we've got Louise Estrella. Hey, everyone. All right, so just to give you guys a quick rundown of what we are going to be talking about today, um, there were a bunch of showcases that happened this weekend, long weekend, whatever you want to call it, and... We are not going to get to all of them, but we are going to talk about the games that interested us the most. Uh, we are also going to give you a something really special. Um, I was lucky enough to fly out to a Summer Games Fest hands-on event and get hands-on with a bunch of games, including Sonic Frontiers. So if you stick around a little bit, you will be able to get some uh, first, you know, hands-on impressions um, from that game. There's a lot to talk about with that. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of some weirder news that happened this week, and then we will finish up the episode talking, as always, about what we have been playing and enjoying lately. Um, so, for our first segment, as I mentioned, lots of stuff happened this week. We can't get to all of it, but what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go through the group, and we, we are each going to pick one Switch game that was revealed from all the various showcases, and talk about it and why we're excited for it. And then after that, we're gonna go through and each pick one game that may not be confirmed for Switch yet and may never come to Switch, but that we are very excited about and just want to talk about regardless because gaming is an exciting space right now. Um, so why don't we start uh, with you, Nicholas? Uh, why don't we start, just give us your, your Switch game of show. What is the, the Switch game that excited you the most? Okay, so um, the Switch game that was shown for me was shown during the Devolver Digital event, uh, and that was the Plucky Squire. This is a new kind of action platformer uh, being developed by James Turner, who people might know as one of the art directors for a lot of recent Pokemon games. He recently left Game Freak, and now he's working in an independent studio, I believe with a friend, and the Plucky Squire is their first new game. And it looks like a really fun, really kind of style, like just nice and stylized picture book adventure where you control this nice little, this little plucky squire <laughs> uh, traveling through this picture book, kind of fighting enemies and whatnot, and eventually leading to this character getting to the end of the picture book and leaping out of the page into the real world. And now he's kind of traversing around a real world, interacting with actual objects, climbing around like books and mugs and pens and whatnot. And it just... It's not exactly... It's a concept that's been done before. Uh, I think most recently people can t can see something similar with uh, It Takes Two, where you have these kind of diminutive figurines interacting with the real world in interesting ways. But I just really love the art style of this game, how it's been shown off. And I really love the kind of interaction between having still having an actual picture book that the character runs around in, but then also having them emerge into this kind of unknown world for them and having them interact from what is a 2D space in the picture book into a 3D space in the uh, real world sections. Yeah, it, it's an amazing idea. I, I saw that trailer in the Devolver Direct and I was like, wow, I can't believe this hasn't been done before. I think at first glance, I know that they're totally different games. The first thing it reminded me of was how like in Super Paper Mario, you can kind of switch the perspective from this 2D side scrolling thing to like this like 3D, you know, like totally changing the angle. But this looks just like, man, like you really are going from this this beautiful hand-drawn 2D game to like what looks like a fairly large 3D environment to jump around and explore. Yeah, I, I, I was really impressed with their style. I think it's been a while since I saw a game that I didn't know anything about, but after seeing the trailer, I just want to play it immediately. It's that kind of game that grab you by the looks. And uh, I don't even know exactly how the game works. I mean, from the look of it, it is kind of a platformer. It's kind of an action game. I don't know exactly. But uh, the art style is just so, so beautiful. I am I hope that the game can maintain all that graphical fidelity on the Switch because I, I'm planning to play on it. And 
it, it always amazes me how the Evolver can find the most interesting concepts in, in the whole indie uh, universe. The, every time there's at least one or two games from their presentations which I found just fantastic concepts that, as you guys said, how, how nobody thought of this before? How never a developer did something like this? And But I don't think it's only about the idea, but the, the execution, it, it, really, it really grabs your eye. Uh, I think it was probably the from the whole presentations uh, that we saw, I think this was the game that I was most uh, interested in. I agree with Nicholas very much on this. I, the game, like, it definitely, it was one of the most, I think, artistically impressive games out of everything shown, really throughout this entire week, I think. Um, it Just the way it goes from 2D to 3D and that mix of styles, especially, because I, 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 you know, much like everyone else, I didn't really know much about this game if anything, until I saw that trailer. And then the moment, you know, the main character jumps out of the page and goes into that 3D space, I mean, I was like, I, I mean, I really, I almost like fell to the floor. Like, I was like, what? You know, it was just so, so impressive. But Nicholas made a great point in that, um, you know, both my girlfriend and I felt the same way, of which the first thing that came to mind immediately was It Takes Two, that sort of similar um art direction that's very inviting and almost like uh i don't want to say similar to like toys but it has that sort of innocent sort of aesthetic to it right so um but yeah it was is beautiful beautiful looking game um like louise said though it's going to be interesting seeing it on switch because that game looks graphically just you know not demanding but just incredibly beautiful and you know could it work on switch yeah sure i mean they i don't think they would even bother trying to port it if that wasn't the case but um, I, I am a little worried um, that, you know, they might take quite a bit of sacrifice unless that's, you know, just really well optimized. But yeah, I'm, I'm just a little scared. You know, thankfully I have other platforms that I can play the game on, so I'll be playing it regardless. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, the Switch version, will, well, that remains to be seen. But either way, the game definitely took me best by surprise and it really just blew me away with just the artistic uh, uh creativity behind it and and just how overall just how pleasing it looked and and how fun it seemed like it was going to be yeah i'm i'm always like you know obviously the 2d stuff looks great you know it's the question is yeah like when they when you switch into that 3d environment how's it going to handle that i'm always particularly curious about that when i see that like this game it was confirmed it's coming out in 2023 on the xbox series x the PlayStation 5, PC, and the, and the Switch. So, so like, they're not even putting in PS4 and Xbox One on that list. So, right. like, so, so that's where that's interesting to me. Yeah, um, it's, like, next-gen only, and then, like, this sort of, like, mid-gen... I don't know, it, it, Switch was Switch is weird, because, like, would you consider it last-gen? Because it kind of came out mid-cycle, right? So it's, like, it, it's, it's hard to... Yeah, it's Nintendo Jam. Really, yeah. It didn't Nintendo Jam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of these... Yeah. yeah, pretty much. And a lot of these games, they, they can be scaled down to an extent and still not lose True. a lot, so we'll, we'll see. But, um, but, yeah, The Plucky Squire, that game is coming out next year on the Switch. Um, Dennis, what was your Switch game of show? Yeah, so my, my Switch game is actually a game uh, that I've actually had on my wish list now. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my Steam wish list, and I've had this game sitting here on my Steam wish list since December 16th, 2020. So it's been there for Ooh. a while uh, because the game's been in development for so long, but uh, it is confirmed to be coming out this summer, I believe, 2022, finally on both PC and Nintendo Switch, which is Snacko. Um, Snacko is this really cute... Uh, Oh, it, this weird like it, it's a hybrid of like 2d and 3d but it does it beautifully where you have this very pixel uh pixel art driven uh, uh game where you just play as this cute little cat and you know you're in this community with other animals and you know it's a farming sim uh and it just looks so so cute to me and yeah it just it drew me in right away you know when i first found it years ago and i'm i'm, I'm happy to hear that it's it's finally coming out and then on switch no less because every time i see this game i'm like man this would be a great switch game but it was announced during the wholesome direct that it is in fact uh coming to switch uh, later this year i'm not sure about other platforms um as far as the uh reveal trailer says it just says switch and pc on the trailer itself so um you know it's possible that it might come out to other platforms later down the line but at the moment just switch and pc and uh yeah who cares about those other first. platforms we don't need those 
Uh, yeah, no, we don't. Uh, we don't, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. What else is out there, anyways? Eh, don't need it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> this game was not on my radar until you mentioned it, Dennis. But I I watched the trailer earlier, and it looks it looks great. Uh, I love the writing. The little glimpses I saw of the writing in the trailer. Like, yeah, there's this one yeah. line where this guy walks up, he's like trying to buy something, and says, sorry, you're too poor. Try again when you're no longer poor. And I, I just <laughs> lost it. Like, that's hilarious. Yeah. I love, like, humor, like, innocent humor like that, especially in such a cute game like this. It, it just really gives the entire experience personality, right? And, uh, and I love just to see the creativity that's coming out from all of these indie studios that are really just, quite frankly, blowing me away year after year after year and you know in a in a place where you know triple a games are all starting to sort of blend into each other um it, it's nice to not have that creative restriction with you know indie games yeah they might not have that budget of you know 50 million dollars but it's clear that they don't need it because you know at the end of the day they're making something special right and it's not about you know that 50 million dollars that's money can't buy creativity right <laughs> right you can buy the people with skills to you know sort of implement their talents to sort uh -huh. of uh, uh uh you know uh, you know showcase some sort of creativity but otherwise you know ultimately without a vision um you know everything kind of falls flat and i think the indie space is just really booming now more than ever and snacko just really seems to to once again just sort of take the lead and you know here's another great animal focused game we're seeing a lot of animal games lately from indie studios i've noticed so uh but uh but yeah, no, Snacko looks absolutely fantastic. The way you grow your crops and customize everything and the beautiful world you're in. And uh, uh, yeah, it just seems like such an immersive, uh, fun, and just cute, wholesome experience. I love how they mesh uh, like a 2D pers The game is 3D, but the characters are kind of 2D in that perspective. Yes. I love that. Uh, we see more and more with the indie studios, they're trying to find new ways to develop new graphical styles without using a lot of budget. And I just love to see it. To your point about, uh, I think in this period of presentations, there are a lot of moments in those big presentations like the Summer Game Fest that it feels like a lot of the games are really, really similar. All of them using that Unreal Engine style with a shooter, very dark and all that stuff. Usually when I'm watching those presentations with my friends, I say, listen, I'm just waiting for the colorful games because I, I know that <laughs> in one moment they will appear in the middle of the show and I'm, I'm here That's for right. that game. <laughs> yeah, and you always know when they show up too because, you know, it's like, hey, I can, I can see everything on screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of these farming games coming out, and I think it takes a lot for games in this genre to stand out. But um, yeah, this one is definitely uh, on my, my radar now. So thank you, Dennis, for yeah, discovering a new great game for me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> in the hundreds of games that were announced this weekend, which is not an exaggeration. Um, yeah, no. Louise, what was your Switch game of show? The game that I decided to talk about here, I think... Uh, I'm not, I think, the perfect person to talk because I was never a big, big on Minecraft. But uh, I was very interested when I saw uh, today when I was watching the Microsoft presentation, and they showed Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Minecraft uh, Legends, which is kind of uh, a new. It is kind of the style of Minecraft and the visuals and all that stuff. But it is kind of an adventure game with some elements of RTS. It kind of remind me mm -hmm. of Pikmin because there's this whole thing with a lot of minions following you and etc. But they didn't show a lot, so I can say for sure. But I, I love the open nature of the game. I love, I think it's funny to me how they, because they have to keep the Minecraft graphics, of course, all that blocky stuff, but they try to make it a little more pleasing to the eye. So they use like uh, some, they try to make a, a, some illumination tricks. You'll see that they are adding a little more of personality to that uh, classic style that to this point it is, of course, uh, immediately related to Minecraft. <laughs> but uh, which when I saw- so, Which is just so, f it's, uh, sorry to interrupt. It's just, it's just so funny to me they're like when i first saw this game i was like wait is this minecraft 2 what are they doing <laughs> and then they're like no 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 we know our main game doesn't look very good don't worry this is a spin-off game it's like, yeah. well, the spin-offs look better than the actual game at this point exactly exactly because <laughs> i mean they can't change the original game <laughs> it is like it has to to have that classic look but uh yeah, but no, I, I, ray I mean, tracing so, so, so sorry to oh this, yeah but like a ray tracing on minecraft books <laughs> i phenomenal. saw that yeah. like my god yeah. it's, it's 
Yeah, but yeah, go ahead. No, so but I I really liked the the, the concept, like the game K concept, and it is being developed by my junk, so it is kind of interesting to see that they are back to to the series, but trying to to develop something different. And I always like to see that Microsoft is still publishing on Switch. I think Microsoft is a better publisher than EA on Switch, for example. Uh, they they really put a lot of great games on on Switch, and I was not expecting to see like games developed by uh, Xbox Studio uh, continue to appear on Switch like day one like this so yeah i i i loved it i i don't i probably play on my xbox because of game pass and all that stuff but i i love the game and i love that it's coming to switch yeah i mean you know like it or not minecraft is this massive brand at this point and they clearly want to make more games in the franchise it really does surprise me that they haven't just made a proper sequel like they seem more interested in yeah. all these spin-off projects and i wonder if we ever will see like a full true sequel to minecraft um, but I don't yeah, see it, why there would be one, honestly. Just because, like, I mean, it, it's always been a live service title, and Minecraft's been around for what almost fifteen years at this point. So, um, you know, and here's this game that they could easily just, you know, expand upon, and they've been doing great with um, putting out, uh, you know, these these level packs through, you know, their their the Minecraft store, you know, and with so many collaborations, right. right, Star Wars, Sonic, all of that. And, and and I agree with you to an extent. I feel like though when you look at like the base game in terms of how they're adding features, it nowadays it's usually just kind of the things like oh we added new types of plants and we made caves deeper and I'm just like all right like there's you know it's, to me I'm not seeing like a lot of the innovation in the main Minecraft game anymore, which makes me wonder if maybe they're saving their ideas for either for spinoffs like these or um, or maybe a big eventual sequel, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this spinoff game looks great. It's bringing some new ideas into the series. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in it. I mean, my, Minecraft Dungeons, I don't know if anybody here played Minecraft Dungeons, but I had a lot of fun with that. A whole lot of fun with that. Um, I played it a little bit uh, via Xbox Game Pass, and it was fantastic. So, I mean, I, you know, I feel like Legends could uh, follow that same sort of, um, you know, just... Just, just follow that. You know the same steps of, of just having a just just an awesome spin-off game that really expands the brand a little bit more, rather than just like here's another level to you know create and, and you know craft with. Uh, you know we're gonna give you something that's you know content packed and and uh, uh, just you know just a fun little spin on you know the Minecraft uh, uh, you know gameplay and just providing something new with that. I, I, so I, I do think Legends um, could end up being. Uh, really, really good if Dungeons is anything to go off. Yeah. yeah. Nicholas, do you have any thoughts on this game? Minecraft Legends? Um, I mean, it looks interesting. I'm not uh, super into Minecraft, but the just the idea of like seeing them expand on the property with all these extra spinoffs. First Dungeons and now... Well, I guess first it was the... Um, the uh, I forget the name. the The studio that makes all those like semi visual novels. They made like Telltale. Batman oh games. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Tell Telltale. Yeah. Um, they had that, and they had Dungeons. Now this. Uh, it's all a very interesting way of trying to expand the franchise. Well, like you said, retaining kind of the core, not changing the um, what makes Minecraft Minecraft. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, uh, Minecraft Legends. Um, I think that game is coming out. Gosh, I feel like it's not too soon. Did they say 2023 for that one? That is a good question. I am not yeah, entirely sure. It, it was certain. during the Xbox so showcase, and I think everything there uh, was supposed to come out within the next 12 months. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So I don't think there's a release date for that one yet, but I guess it's not going to be too long. Um, my Switch game is show, uh, and again, there was a lot to pick from. I actually had a hard time picking one, just one, but... Um, the game that caught me the most off guard that was announced this weekend was Bright Memory Infinite is being ported to Switch, which uh, I don't know, for, for those of you who are familiar with this game, go look up a trailer on YouTube. This is an absolutely gorgeous first-person shooter that has some uh, sword play elements involved. It's kind of science fiction-y, futuristic. You're battling through this rain-drenched um, environment and... Uh, the original game was was developed by one person, and then it got it got bigger. And um, when it was re-revealed, it was kind of shown off as like the showcase for PC gaming and for the next generation of consoles. And like, if you look at this game, you will I will like I cannot fathom how on earth they are going to get this game running on the Switch. It just 
It does not seem possible to me, to be honest. It must be, or they wouldn't have announced it, but, you know. I, I was, like, looking yeah. for, like, that little asterisk that said cloud version, and I couldn't find it, so. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's what we've, that's the point we've gotten to now with Switch, where it's just, like, if something comes on the Switch that we're, that we're just, like, that's not possible, then we look for that cloud version, and it's just, like, yeah, that makes sense, okay. You feel like <laughs> you have to know, do a double take, <laughs> yeah. It's right. like, what, how? <laughs> Yeah, Bright Memory Infinite is is visually insane. But I'm on the Steam page now um, because it, and it seems like it seems like uh, it is Steam Deck verified. So you know now I understand the Steam Deck compared to the Switch. The Steam Deck is an absolute powerhouse compared to the Switch, right? But it's also a newer ha handheld that just came out. Like you know, well, it's still slowly rolling uh -huh. out, really, if anything. Um, but if, if they can get it working on sort of portable hardware like that um i'm sure they can scale it down just a little bit more to you know make it work on the switch now again two completely different you know pieces of technology really and the guts are in the steam deck are obviously going to be vastly superior to the switch but um you know again i i think having that steam deck verification and compatibility could give an idea of what it could be like um on on switch but yeah I, I definitely won't be anywhere near as pretty expect a much lower resolution um possibly 30 frames i, I highly doubt they're going to aim for 60 you know um, <laughs> maybe yeah it, it gives you hope at least though you know you're like all right yeah, switch bit, yeah. still has some life in it if they're bringing games like this over yeah uh louise nicholas are you guys still do you guys still play these like you know when when you get these crazy ports on the switch do you guys still play these or has everyone moved on and just been like, nah, you know, the novelty of playing it on a handheld is kind of, at least on the Switch, you know. For the most part, um, not really, just because I have access to a PC platform that I can play the games on if I really want to. And as impressive as it is to have games like uh, Doom or The Witcher running on Switch, it is genuinely just going to be a, a smoother experience if I just run it through a PC because there's just going to be a, that little bit more power to make things work and just look a little bit nicer. But uh, looking at this game in particular, because now that you're fine, now that you're talking about it, I, I'm actually remembering that it was showcased this like random first person shooter that looked absolutely insane for the system. <laughs> like, and you're you're right. I don't know how this is getting, <laughs> why this is this of all things is getting ported to the Switch, or how they're even going with that porting job. But it is. This is just this is something to keep an eye on, just because it's going to be very interesting to see in what state it eventually makes its way to the platform. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I just saw the trailer right here, and yeah, I can't believe it. <laughs> I, I I can't see it running on Switch, at least in the way that it is. But uh, about the the whole idea of these parts, I think uh, after I bought my Xbox, I really. Because usually there are third-party games which are not only running better on the Xbox, but they are technically free because I play, uh, I have my Game Pass. So it is really hard to get the Switch version that I have to pay and it is probably run worse. But yeah. I must say that I'm always fascinated by those parts. I always love to see how they are running. I think I enjoy more the Digital Foundry video about the game than the proper game. <laughs> so I'm uh, just because I, I, I'm enthusiastic for that stuff. I always I love to see those those impossible those crazy parts. And now I have this one on my radar. I'm very interested to see how it will turns out. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, time will tell, as we always like to say, and uh, I'm sure someone will review it, but. Um, but yeah, that game is very interesting to me for the Switch. Um, all right, so let's move on. We, so we, we, we're still going to talk about more games that were shown off, uh, but now we're going to shift gears and talk about games that have not been confirmed for Switch, and in some cases will probably never come to Switch. <laughs> I, I know this is a, a Nintendo podcast, but you know we all play games elsewhere, and we're just all excited about a lot of stuff. So, um, so Dennis, what was your uh, most hyped game that was not a Switch game that was shown off this weekend. Yeah, so, so far, I mean, there was definitely a lot, right? Just with the hundreds of games shown, it's hard to keep up with it all. But the one I keep thinking about um, is uh, the Callisto Protocol. The Callisto Protocol is made by a team of ex-developers that worked on uh, the original Dead Space series. 
And so, you, and you can see that right away just by looking at one trailer of it, right? Like, I mean, the vibes are all there. I mean, it still takes place in space. It's a horror game, right? You have that, um, that's even similar animations, really. There's a stomp animation that's very similar to, to, um, Isaacs and in, in Dead Space, and uh, but everything just gives off just tremendous Dead Space vibes. But it, what the, what excites me isn't the fact that it reminds me of Dead Space. It's the fact that here they took the formula of Dead Space, but ended up creating something that feels refreshing, exciting, and uh, new. Uh, it just it looks insane, much like how Dead Space was when it originally came out, and it kind of goes back to those original horror roots of Dead Space as well. Um, those have a, that have stuck with the Dead Space series probably know by that by Dead Space 3, that game was essentially the Resident Evil 5 of Dead Space, right, where it was just pure action. Like, there was nothing scary about that game. Dead Space 1 and 2, however, 1 in particular, um, is one of the few games... I'm someone who plays a lot of horror games, right? But Dead Space uh -huh. 1 is one of the few games that genuinely, t like, frightens me. Like, that game is hard for me to go through no matter how many times I've tried. I have beaten it, but... It's terrifying. <laughs> it, it is. is. It terrifying. really is. It really is. Um, and Callisto Protocol seems to be taking me back to that. And, again, coming from the team that created Dead Space, um, I, I expect no less, right? And, uh, yeah, it just looks like such a fantastic, uh, mind-blowing time if you're a fan of, uh, you know, both sci-fi and uh, survival horror. So, yeah, I'm just I'm super stoked for that. Yeah, I was super impressed with what I saw of the Callisto Protocol. I'm definitely going to pick it up. The, the only thing that is, and, you know, people were, like you said, kind of joking about this, but, like, I, I'm still not really seeing a lot of... It really just looks like Dead Space. I'm not seeing so far a lot of new ideas in this game. Yeah. And, and maybe, I don't know, maybe they're... I'm sure, I'm sure they're in there, but, it, you know... Everything I saw, I was like, this feels Dead Space, and I'm not really sure what this game is trying to do differently. And it does also kind of have to compete with, coming out early next year, the Dead Space remake. So that's, right. that's going to drive some interesting mm -hmm. comparisons. Um, but hey, you know what? If we never get a Dead Space 4, this is the next best thing in my book. That is that is true. Well, not to mention, I think I think we're I think we're set too. Because I mean, I think the joke going around with especially Summer Games Fest was like, my God, look at all these you know, <laughs> is these space survival horror games all of a sudden? You know, now we have a just a you know just a buffet of them. So uh, <laughs> so I think I think we're set. We're set for a while. Um, yeah, and like just talking about how like you know the Dead Space games. I um yeah I never got through Dead Space two I, I finished Dead Space one and that was that was tough Dead Space two I just couldn't do yeah. it. <laughs> it's terrifying it really is but yeah it's one of the few games that have like really genuinely terrified me that alongside Silent Hill four Silent Hill four I remember having to I couldn't even have that game like in my house like that that's how scared I was of that game was <laughs> I would just wake up look over a seat on my shelf and I'd just immediately get chills so I had to get you look at the box <laughs> art and you just scream you're like ah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's it's you it's know right some games you. just have that. They just have that sort of you know direct connection to you for better or for worse. And you know when it's a horror game, man, it's it's yeah, it gets under your skin sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, Callisto Protocol is currently penciled in for uh, December of this year and is not coming to Switch. And I'll be very surprised if it does. Um, although not a surprise now that we have Bright Memory Infinite coming to Switch in this world. Um, <laughs> Luis Estrella, what is your non-Switch game of show? So the one that I, I it was today on again on the Microsoft's presentation, and I think it was probably my favorite presentation from the one that I saw, and right close to yeah, the you end. You can't the, say that, Luis. This is a <laughs> Nintendo podcast. May I remind oh, you? Oh, but listen, there's. No, <laughs> I think this presentation okay, was okay. probably the one that had most Nintendo games announced. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a good point. So, uh, but close to the end of the show, they announced uh, that all the Persona games will be coming to Xbox and to Game Pass. Uh, all no, not all games, but Persona 3, Persona 4, and Persona 5. And I was super happy to see that because uh, I think this series. I'm a certified noob on the series because I only played Persona 5, but I always wanted to play Persona 3 and Persona 4. And those games were kind of locked uh, on Sony platforms with mm -hmm. Persona 4 already available on Steam. But I, I don't like to play on PC because I work on PC, so I don't like to mix stuff. So I was really excited with that announcement. I think I'll finally be able to play uh, the third game and the fourth game. 
And the only thing that I want more than that is to play those on Switch. But if they right. come to X, yeah, if they come to to Xbox, it's it's already uh, an awesome thing. I mean, it's it's pretty rare to see uh, Atlas making a logical decision. <laughs> a lot of the times when <laughs> when Atlas it's so true. This is to, Atlas, decides yeah. to publish the, their games, they always choose the wrong platform. But right now, I think that it's it's perfect. It's I mean, it took a while to see. Persona and other platforms, but I, I think it's for the best, and I have a feeling that eventually it will come to Switch, because it felt to me like it was uh, maybe a contract or something related to Game Pass to make an ex exclusivity for Microsoft, oh, yeah. but, but probably, I mean, I don't know at the end of 2023 or in 2024, we'll see uh, those games on Switch. Yeah, I mean, it is weird, because like, you know, Atlas... You, the Xbox does not sell well in Japan. Just historically, <laughs> yeah. it has been the worst selling of the big three in Japan. And the, the Series X is doing a little bit better. But Microsoft, I feel like they just had to have offered Atlas just a crap ton of money for them to be, be like, all right, we're, we're finally announcing this thing that everyone wants. For sure. But it's on, <laughs> only coming to Xbox. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no other explanation in my mind. But, um, but yeah, they, hopefully at some point they've got to come elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we'll we'll see. Microsoft has a great relationship with Sega, though, so you know, uh, I, I feel like uh, I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, money talks, right? But right. Uh, but I, I feel like they didn't really have much issue kind of bringing it over, especially with I mean, they've been kind of doing such a great job lately with just porting so much of their catalog onto the Xbox, right? I mean, we've seen the entire Yakuza uh, series, right, show up on Xbox and Game Pass on top of that. And then same mm -hmm. thing with uh, Judgment and Lost Judgment as well. I mean, yeah, they were on pri they were on other platforms, you know, before that. But, you know, now to have that all there and, you know, these incredible games, and then now we're seeing that with Persona soon, um, that's, that's huge, you know, and it's a step in the right direction, especially with... You know, the Xbox One did a terrible job at sort of diminishing the Japanese output, right? Because on 360, there were so many phenomenal uh, games, exclusive games too, right? Like Blue Dragon, like Infinite Discovery, and so on and so forth. So, um, but Xbox One had none of that in terms of like, you know, Japanese uh, yeah. uh, exclusive games. You know, we were going to get scale bound, but we all know what happened to that. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, it's really exciting to see, you know, Phil Spencer kind of take the helm and, you know, really kind of, uh, you know, rekindle those relationships. And, and, and now we're seeing um, within the last couple of years and definitely moving forward, um, you know, that uh, effort really being put on display. Because not only with that, but, you know, now we have the new game from Team Ninja even coming to uh, Xbox. Mm -hmm. I think it's called Woe Long or something, which looks awesome. So. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that uh, was totally out of left field. it is, I think it is a smart decision from Microsoft's part to bring those games from uh, Japan to the US. I mean, Persona after Persona 5, I think Persona is bigger on the US than in Japan, if we talk about sales number and all of that stuff. Probably. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's such a smart uh, decision to bring 3 and 4 to, to Game Pass because I think a lot of people will be interested in, in playing those games. Yeah. The only thing I saw, you know, in regards with Persona 3, you know, there's a couple different versions of that game. And Persona 3 Portable, you know, on one hand, it, it does add, in the original Persona 3, you didn't have full control of your party in combat. And so the portable version does add that. But the thing that is lost with the, and it also adds you can play as a female protagonist, which was a huge deal for the franchise. Um, but something that was lost in the portable version is you don't actually have exploring the 3D overworld like you do in Persona 4 and 5 and like you did in the original version of the game because it was simplified down for the PSP. Um, and also the cutscenes in the PSP version were replaced with just kind of static images. So it's not really the full Persona 3 experience in the minds of a lot of fans and a lot of people have been hoping for a while that they would, that Alice would kind of develop a definitive version of the game that takes yeah. some of the good parts of the portable version and some of the best parts of FES, which was kind of an enhanced version of Persona 3, yeah. and combine them. But but we're not we're not getting that. We're we are getting it's still better than nothing, but I know some fans were a little disappointed by that. They're like we see this game for the first time in so many years and it's it's just not what some folks were hoping for. But can't please everyone, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I mean just I mean, seeing Atlas kind of loosened the leash, though, is it's just nice to see, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is yeah. extremely nice. Yeah. 
Uh, Nicholas, what was your non Nintendo game of show, or just just your other your your second choice? Um, well, <laughs> if I'm gonna go for non Nintendo game of choice, it's going to be Street Fighter Six, and we can talk about that a little bit as well if you guys want. But uh, the other game that I really want to talk about is Silk Song, finally being shown off after like three years. <laughs> People can finally take off their clown makeup. It's here. <laughs> it exists. <laughs> It's funny because everyone was expecting to see it on Indie World, and I, I said that some t- uh, a couple of times. But I think Silk Song is too big for Indie World. It is like a, a almost a triple A game in the way that people are really expecting to see it. So yeah. it was awesome to see in a triple A uh, presentation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure what there really is to say about the game itself, to be honest, because it it just looks good. It's a Hollow Knight sequel. You ha- you're playing as Hornet. You have a whole bunch of new moves. Everything looks fantastic. Uh, I feel like just the fact that we know this game still exists and we can actually see it, and we also know now that it's releasing within the next year, is uh, <laughs> I feel like that's more than a lot uh, than what a lot of Hollow Knight fans could be asking for. <laughs> yeah, it's I um, I, the I most mind blowing part to me, I think, is the fact that it was shown on uh the xbox showcase right instead of uh the nintendo direct which will probably be here soon within the next couple of weeks right because yeah i mean yeah i mean i i think at this point like you were saying it's too big to have gotten an indie world and i think if it was in this most recent indie world because i think we talked about this last time where it's it would overshadow everything right and and that's not good or healthy for all the other great content shown right like silk song needs to be up there at this point with all the other big all the other big games just because just from the hype alone right so um but i think people were expecting to see that on a nintendo direct like the official their sort of e3 yeah. version of it not you know the xbox one just out of nowhere so i think that was probably the biggest surprise but hey i think people are just happy to see it regardless they don't care where it's being shown so long as we're seeing it people are happy yeah <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah, it's I, I, it's always good to see uh, a game announced for Game Pass. It's another addition. Day one, apparently. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, and Hollow Knight was already just a very just visually impressive game and very well animated. And looking at the trailer for Silk Song, it, I mean, I could immediately tell the difference. I was like, this is even a step up from that. Somehow they did it. <laughs> Yeah, the, the game looks beautiful, and uh, I think in the gameplay department, I don't think they have to do anything crazy, because Hollow Knight was already so complex, so if they give us new areas, new moves, we already saw a lot of new moves in this trailer, the game looks faster, because of Hornet has some different movements from Hollow Knight, so it, it just looks... I just want to play it already, uh, sadly we did not <laughs> get uh, a release date yet, but... I think it's just the the kind of stuff that we we have to wait a, li- a little bit more. It's a game that I'm not sure it, it is if it is hand drawn, but it has that look of a hand drawn game, and we know that games yeah. like this, like Cuphead, for example, they take a lot of time to develop because it is a a little bo- a, a little more of a handmade process. So we have to wait, but so far, looking really good. Yeah, the writing is on the wall. That one will probably be worth the wait. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, it, th- this is a game I'm very excited to talk about, and seriously, like, you know, it, I feel like nowadays, I, we see so many games, it takes a lot for a game to just really just absolutely just blow my mind. Um, when I was watching the Devolver Direct, they showed off this amazing looking game called Skate Story. Um, if you have not seen the trailer for this game, do yourself a favor, plug in a good pair of headphones and go watch this trailer, because... It is, I, I'm not exaggerating, it is one of the most is visually creative games I've ever seen. It is like, I, I, it's a skateboarding game, but you're going through this just, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, <laughs> they just, the description for the Steam page, it says, you grind your way through the ash and smoke of the underworld. Um, <laughs> but it, you're like skating through like this kind of like modern... It, it, everything looks like it's made out of glass and the lighting is very I don't know disco-y the, it, it just looks incredible um, did you guys see the trailer for this game? Uh, I'm seeing it right now and yeah I never saw something like that I think it looks really awesome uh, at the first look I thought it was something like a, a Riven game but I'm, I, I don't think so it's more about the 
the the acro like a skate game as usual but i'm not listening to the song so i i'm not sure I, i'm not having the full experience here but <laughs> oh my god the the visuals are, are amazing yeah you know like skateboarding games you know I, i can appreciate them and they are good fun for me for a little while but they don't they generally don't hold my interest for a super long time but something like this i could absolutely see myself getting lost in I guess I'm just kind of a sucker for games that kind of have this dreamlike, trance-like aesthetic to them. And um, this one is only confirmed for PC at the moment, but I can just imagine it. I, I think I mentioned in the past, but I do have a Steam Deck coming, hopefully in the next month or two. And uh, man, this game is just going to be stunning on that. So it th that is absolutely one of my favorite games that was shown off this weekend. I, I, I will say, I think when I when I first heard, because I didn't watch the Devolver uh, Direct until um, a little bit after um, it aired. So, uh, but, I, you know, I did see sort of like, you know, rumblings of, of things that, you know, that were happening over over Twitter. And now when I saw, when I heard about Skate Story, I haven't seen any, uh, you know, any pictures or video of it yet. Uh, but when I heard Skate Story, my thought immediately went to, I thought it was the new game from the guys that made Golf Story, but then I was like, <laughs> well, hold on, they're working on Sports Story at the moment, and that's not even out. How are they already doing Skate Story, <laughs> you know? That's funny. So, so yeah, but then like, I saw I it, and I was like... Is, where is that game? Where is Sports I, Story? Dude, I don't know. I don't know, but I, I needed it yesterday. <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? I love Golf Story, so... Uh, so, yeah, no, I need that game, like, yesterday. Uh, but Skate Story, uh, like you were saying, Nick, just looks uh, absolutely fantastic. I mean, that game, like, really was one of the standout games, I think, uh, this this week so far. Like, just strictly speaking, visually, I mean, wow. I mean, just way to, way to just... You know, develop a new sort of art direction and then like own it too. You know, and yeah. the whole concept behind it is just fantastic. It's a very Devolver game, for sure. Oh, very much. Very much, yeah. <laughs> um, which, by the way, if anyone out there is listening and has not gone to watch the Devolver Direct this year, please do yourself a favor. It is, it is just always one of the most entertaining <laughs> things to happen in the summer. With one of the, the most. World. <laughs> Yeah, with one of the most yeah. entertaining uh, uh, video game developers of all time as well, <laughs> Suda51. Yeah. We yeah. all we all love Suda51 here. So. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you everyone for being patient as we all nerded out about the games that excited us. Um, now we are going to move on to something very exciting. Uh, so I was very lucky to have the opportunity to uh, Nintendo Everything. We were invited out to. A special event as part of Summer Games Fest. It was called Summer Games Fest Play Days. It was just this last weekend in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, nothing on the scale of E3, but it was very cool in the sense that we got to get hands on time with uh, some big games and some smaller games. And there were a lot of developers there, uh, there were a lot of people from across the industry there, and it was really cool to get to talk with some of them. Um, so there's you know, I'm not gonna be able to talk about all the games I played. Um, you should definitely stay tuned to NintendoEverything.com because we're gonna have all types of hands-on impressions pieces coming up over the next week or so. Um, some interviews, some really cool stuff. Uh, and, on the, and on the YouTube channel as well. So definitely keep an eye out there. But we're gonna talk about a few games today. And the one I wanna talk about first is the one that was probably one of the bigger games there, uh, Sonic Frontiers. Um, I was very lucky to get almost a full hour with that game, um, just to kind of do whatever I wanted with it. And I got to play through, um, I played through kind of like a, a demo area, and then I they kind of dropped me into the open zone that they showed off in the recent IGN gameplay reveal trailer. And I just kind of got to have a run around it and, um, you know, test out the combat a little bit, test out some of the platforming, um, and I was very impressed with what I saw for the most part. It, it was a very early build of the game. Uh, I was in pretty rough shape technically, you know, uh, and uh, that's just kind of where things are, you know, when a game is not, when you go to these types of events, these games are being shown before they're done. So I'm not going to be judging it too harshly on how it looks um, at the moment, but, um, but yeah, so I, you know, I know everyone has a bunch of questions, so I feel like if you guys just have anything you want to know about the game, you know, I'd be happy to try and answer it. <laughs> so, uh, just uh, did, did you play anything that was on show in the IGN presentation, like a different area or something like that, or it was exactly that same open zone? 
So there were, there was more to the demo than I can talk about today. There are some things mm. that can't be talked about yet. Um, but as far as what was in this first, you know, this big open zone, um, yeah, I did. So the the main thing that stuck out to me, you know, I'm not watching the IGN demo right now, um, but there were there was a lot more I think scattered around the environment than I think the IGN demo showed off. Like the world, you know, I feel like in the initial gameplay videos I was looking at, I was like, oh, it doesn't seem like there's a lot in the world to do. But there's actually a really good amount of platforming challenges and kind of tucked away puzzles. And um, there's a, like a surprising amount of like bosses just kind of roaming around this first area. Um, one of them was flying up in the air and it kind of had, I don't know what it was called, but it was, it was like flying in the air and it had this kind of trail it was leaving behind it. And I had to think to myself, I was like, okay, if I want to fight this boss, I have to find a way to get high enough to like jump down onto its like tail. And, um, <laughs> and I, so I was able to do it and I was kind of like racing along the back of it to try and get to its head. And so like, that was something that I was like, totally caught me off guard. I was like, wow, like there's, there's a lot more to do in this first zone than I think I initially thought. Oh, that, that's awesome. Yeah. I think they showed that boss in the Sonic Central gameplay exclusive. And uh, I, I had the impression that this was like a, a specific boss section. I, 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 didn't ha I didn't thought that like you could access that from the open zone. So now that you are mentioning that he is like flying the open zone, it sounds way cooler than, than when I saw it. Yeah, it, it's an incredibly open game. You're pretty much dropped in and you to progress to the next area, you have to basically complete a certain number of little tasks around the environment. And it's kind of up to you though, what you want to do. You know, you can go and you can try and take on the bosses or you can try and do some activities that are more based around exploration. Um, but it's, it's very free form. And I think that is gonna leave players with a lot to do you know. Hmm. Um, I was kind of wondering in terms of the game, just what is like, obviously you didn't have that much time with demo, but what was the general flow of it like in terms of like how you're progressing from objective to objective, what exactly you were trying to accomplish? Was it, you know, really, really super open or are there specific things you were trying to do to be able to progress to like a next objective, that kind of thing? Okay, so... So the map is not, so it's an open map, but so, and, and this was something, so I asked the PR rep at Sega and I was like, okay, so, so far we've only seen kind of this like region. I was like, are there other regions in the game? He was like, he said there were other biomes. He was like, he was like you know, this okay. biome has waterfalls and grass and stuff. And as you progress through the game, you'll come into other biomes. He didn't elaborate or anything, but that was what he said. So, so what, what I kind of gathered while I was playing this game was, um, you you unlock portions of the map. So you have like a map that kind of shows you the overall zone that you're in, uh, but it's not all filled in from the start. And there are certain, they're not like, it's not like climbing towers or anything, but um, you basically, as you explore the map, you'll come across, you know, puzzles or, you know, challenges. And uh, mostly I think a good amount of like combat focused stuff. There are some challenges that are kind of like on a timer. So like, you'll hit a switch or something and you have to like, you know, race to a different part of the map or take out a certain mm -hmm. number of enemies in a certain amount of time. And when you do enough of these things, I can't remember what they're called off the top of my head, but basically you pick up these little like, you know, shards or pieces or whatever. And once you get enough of them, you can take them to like this gate and then it opens up, you know, a gate that was blocking your path and you can go explore more of the open zone. Um, so it is kind of like segmented into sections, but you can go back and you, you can explore these zones at any time. It, it is one big open world. Um, you just complete basically the, these smaller objectives to open up more of it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, um, some, something else that I thought was really interesting that they didn't talk about was there's actually two different styles of play in this game. So when you start the game, you can pick between um, high speed style and a different style. Uh, let me look at my notes real quick. It was called like adventure style or something like that. Um, 
but there's basically two different modes and they they really drastically change how Sonic plays and feels. The like adventure mode is um, slower. Um, Sonic feels a little bit like weightier. Um, it's the description was like it's designed for people who are new to a Sonic game. Whereas the high speed mode, the game speed just ramps up considerably. And Sonic moves much faster. Uh, the enemy speed is much faster. There's more like projectiles and stuff coming at you from some of the bosses. So, um, so and I, I played both modes and I think, I, I couldn't tell for sure, but when I switched over to the high speed mode, I was like, this feels much faster than like what we have seen so far. And it was, I thought it was much more fun to play for myself personally. Judging off the footage that we saw from IGN, do you, do you know if they were playing in high speed mode or adventure mode? I'm not, I don't know if that was ever elaborated in their videos. They didn't. They didn't say at the time, and I, I didn't really have an opportunity to to ask. But um, but I think it's great. You know, at least that they're like giving people the option. Yeah. No. That's that's awesome. Yeah. No. I only asked because the IGN um, video felt kind of. I don't know. I just felt like it could have been just a little bit faster so i'm not sure if that was adventure mode or high speed mode that they were going through but uh i definitely feel like they could have been just uh slightly faster somebody made a good point that in the ign footage there was actually a bird that was flying faster than sonic was running so uh <laughs> just in the air so uh but uh, but yeah that's what kind of has me curious um I, I guess really the only question i have was in terms of like the biomes that you go through and uh, the one that, that you experienced um was there any, is it just sort of arbitrarily placed structures and stuff anywhere? Or like, is there actually like a core design philosophy around it? Like, is there like, are they metho actually methodically placed once you actually get, you know, a hands on with it and get to turn the camera around and really kind of take it all in? Does it make sense where everything's placed or is it just sort of, you know, like, okay, let's just run around this playground and, you know, just kind of figure things out. Um, and is there like a city? at all because i think the biggest problem i have with uh the sonic footage that we've seen so far again anything can change between now and release but um it's just you know i i do wish even with a lack of structures and just nothing but land um there's a lack of life right just organic life that just you know other than the birds in the sky like sonic's really the only thing on the ground outside of the enemies you know like where's all the you know, just I, I would like to see at least just like a deer running <laughs> or something. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So so I I, th I think what you're getting at in terms you, we talked about like oh it's weird that there's all these floating railings and stuff that look just kind of randomly placed around the environment. Is that kind of what you're getting at with that? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Like, is there actually like a design philosophy behind it, or does it actually feel like it's completely just sporadically placed? No, yeah, so I think that is definitely one of those things where it feels much better when you're playing. You know, when you pause the game and you're just looking at it, the rails do look very randomly placed and they don't really look like they're connecting to anything. And I think there might have been a couple rails when I was playing the game where I was like, this, like, where is this supposed to take me? But for the most part, when I was actually navigating through the environment, a lot of the rails do feel placed. They're, the best way I can describe them is they feel like either ways to navigate more efficiently through the environment, because it is a very vertical environment. There are a lot of things that are higher up that are like, give you like bonus rings, or uh, maybe will give you extra like of the item pickups to help you progress more quickly through next gate. Mm -hmm. So if you decide you're like, you see like this complicated rail system, you're like, all right, well like, where's this gonna take me? And you'll see something kind of up at the top and you're like, oh, I wonder like if I, if I do this, then maybe I can, you know, so, so there is a level of, you're not just going on these rails just like for the fun of it, you're doing it because there's some type of benefit to doing so. E either that it makes it more efficient to, to get around the environment or um, because there's something interesting looking at the other side. Um, and there was definitely, you know, more than I had time to experience in the demo. But there were definitely a few areas where I looked at something and I saw something kind of high up and I was like, I bet there's a way to get up there. You know, I, I can't figure it out right now, but I like I, I wish I could explore a bit and, you know, figure that out. So it feels like a game that people who also are like very into speed running are going to have a lot of fun with because um, there's a lot of options to get around once you leave this opening tutorial area. Yeah, it, it sounds really cool. Uh... I, I just want to ask you about uh, the controls because 
uh, for example, the combat. We saw an IGN video about the combat, but we are just seeing the animations. So I don't know if the player was pressing just one button or if it was a combo with a combination of buttons. So I'm a, I'm a little curious uh, how many buttons of the control the games use. Is the combat like a little complex or are you just mashing a button? How, how it works? Okay, so this game, um, it has... So I was pretty early on, I think, you know, this demo, I think, was takes place pretty early in the game. And um, so I didn't have a lot unlocked, but you can actually unlock new skills for Sonic as you oh. progress through the game. You pick up, like, skill pieces, and then once you get enough oh. of them, they connect into skill points. Then you can unlock more abilities for Sonic. Um, you can up his speed even more if you want, was one of the things they mentioned. Um, there are different types of pieces that you can collect that... I think you take them to someone and they you can make Sonic stronger or increase his defense or whatever. So there's a, it seems like I didn't get to see a lot of this, but the game kind of tells you during the demo. It's like, oh, you can do this. And so it seems like there's a lot of room to, you know, upgrade Sonic as you progress through the game. How much so, we won't really know until we get to play the full thing. But even just as I was playing through, I took on a couple of different mini bosses and there was this one really big boss through the environment. And there's quite a bit going on with combat. I had a really good time playing it. Um, so you have your basic kind of like homing attack, right? Where Sonic just kind of like locks onto an enemy and zooms towards it and does damage. Um, but you can also perform that attack in midair. So you can kind of like, like launch an enemy up into the air and do some aerial attacks there. Uh, you have like a dodge, which you can also use in the air. Um, you have kind of like a ground stomp thing um, that you unlock af after a certain point. And you also have this ability called the, the Psy Loop, which is what you see in the trailer where Sonic is uh, kind of circling his enemies. And that also can kind of act as a stun. It can also kind of lower enemies' armor and allow you to go in for an attack. So a big thing with the combat from what I played was kind of figuring out what are these enemies' weaknesses, because most of these are not enemies that you just take out very quickly. They're ones that have pretty varied attack patterns. And so you do actually kind of have to like really pay attention and be like, oh, like I need to find an opening for me to you know, actually get some damage in, or I need to find a way to remove its armor. You know, um, It was a lot of fun, and some of the bosses were, were really impressive to me. Uh, and just, I think, to, to see your final thoughts, I remember that from the last podcast, you were you had a, a positive impression from the gameplay that you saw on iGen. So my question to you now is, do, uh, do you still have a positive reaction, uh, like in the same level? Or are you more interested in the game now after playing it or less interested? Ooh, <laughs> that, that's a good one. Um, you know, I would say I'm about where I was. Um, I think the game looks great. You know, I, I'm not saying that's a cop out answer. It's really hard to say for sure because, like I said, technically, like the demo I played from a technical perspective, it was very rough. The cutscenes were not finished yet. Um, there was a lot of pop in. There were some weird glitches here and there. And it's the kind of thing where you're like, you know, it's probably going to get ironed out in time for release, but we just don't know for sure. So that's really the area where I'm most hesitant. Um, everything else that I played, I'm I'm very optimistic about it. I feel like it is going to be very different for Sonic fans. Um, but I think it, I really think it does take a lot of these disparate elements and it makes them all work. The, the combat was, was a pretty good challenge, but it was rewarding. Um, once I was playing on high speed mode, I thought like the sense of speed was there. Um, you also have a boost button that you can use to kind of like give him an extra burst of speed, but you have to wait for it to recharge. Um, so yeah, I, I was really impressed with what I played. I get the sense that there's a lot more to this game that um, Sega is not yet ready to show off yet. So, yeah, that's <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah, I got I got that impression that it's like they are they are hiding a lot still. So, uh, I I still want to see a lot more from this game. But in, in all honesty, I hope that they don't release this year. I hope that they take a little bit more time to. Because I think that that this game, if if they nail it, it can be one of the best Son the best games in the series, and it can really bring Sonic back to uh, a good place with gamers and with fans. So, 
I, I'm really excited to it, and I think the ideas that they have here from what you, you said, they, they are great. It's just a matter of making a, a great execution. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think they can make it work, uh, and I and I and I hope that they do. It's just you know, again, early first impressions probably weren't the best, and and it's it's like you were saying, Louise. I, I think they're hiding something. I I really do, and but it's weird that they were willing to show off what they have now, when I feel like even internally, I wonder if they were thinking to themselves like, eh, maybe, maybe we should wait a little bit longer. But maybe there was upper management that was just like, no, no, we gotta get you know. Just for marketing purposes, we got to get this out now, you know, even if yeah. the reception's sort of negative. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know. You know, it, again, as always, remains to be seen. So, yeah, it it feels a lot better to play than it looked. I think is the main thing to take away. So, I think people who are interested in this game should probably continue to be interested in it because I think it's, I think it's going to be good. I don't know if it's going to be amazing, but I think it's going to be good, good to great territory. So. Um, but yeah, so that was the big game I played at Summer Games Fest, and uh, it was really fun. That was probably what I was most looking forward to. Uh, but I did play some other stuff. Um, I was able to get a little bit of hands-on time with Cuphead, The Delicious Last Chorus, which is the new uh, DLC expansion uh, that's coming out to, uh, to the game, to Cuphead. It's coming out on June 30th, which is right around the corner. Um, I didn't get to play too much of this one. <laughs> And uh, they basically, they had one boss that they were kind of showing off, and it was the same boss that was shown off in the recent gameplay trailer. It was kind of the, the frozen, I don't know what, it, what, his, what his name was, but he's kind of like the frozen ice wizard guy who turns yeah. into yeah, a fridge. Yeah, I saw it, and, I saw yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that was what I played through, and um, it, you know, it's definitely like more Cuphead. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, the, I did actually have a very cool opportunity to um, interview uh, the studio director of that game. Uh, her name was Maya, and um, she was very nice, and she had a lot to talk about just kind of with the game's development um, cycle. And uh, what, one thing that I was really excited to learn, um, Dennis, you asked me, you were curious, you were like, you know, what are you guys going to do next? Would you guys ever go in, into 3D or anything like that? Yeah. And what what she told me was, uh, well, here, let me pull up my quote. I don't, I don't want to misquote her here. Let's see. Uh, so she, she said, um, what I can say is that we feel so intimate with having brought 2D animation on paper back to life. Uh, and she said, we will stick with 2D animation. We'll stick with, in the foreseeable future, pencil to paper, but the genre and what's next, she said that's something that they're not ready to talk about yet. But she said they have firm plans. They already have something that is like, you know, they know what they're doing next. Um, and she kind of left the door open that it could be something different. Yeah. That's so, exciting. I mean, it's a super talented studio. I mean, I think when Cuphead came out, it, it took a lot of people by surprise. Just, I mean, primarily just because the animation in that game is fantastic, and the fact that everything is hand drawn. I mean, truly, just a just uh, just such a, a creative achievement. Really, that game is. Um, so it's exciting to kind of see it back in the in the spotlight with this new DLC. I'm, I'm super stoked for it. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so the thing with this DLC, so she kind of laid out the scope of it a little bit. She said there are five, basically, bosses. She says it's the biggest island in the game. So compared to um, the size of the islands in the other games, she says it's bigger than any of them. Um, the thing that really impressed me was we were get, talking a little bit about, like, the technical work that went into making this DLC. And she said, you know, the big thing was, like, the big area where they're innovating is in um, the background work. So one of the things that they're doing now is, you know, like, you know, when you defeat a boss in Cuphead, it kind of changes its form. She said in some of the boss battles, you'll actually kind of like, like, you know, you maybe like land a certain amount of damage. You actually like transition to a totally different background and environment. She said they like... They like had to like triple or quadruple the number of like frames of animation for those backgrounds. Um, she said that they basically doubled the size of their orchestra for this new DLC. Um, wow. So they're really like upping their production values for this expansion. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Yeah, it it, it is kind of new, a new game almost to uh, to compare. I think it's something kind of similar to Silk Song. Uh, we are seeing like more of the same, but of course with a better quali uh, quality of production and more and more stuff. And the style of Cuphead's never gets old, so it just looks so beautiful. I saw that gameplay that you mentioned it, and I, I, I'm just I, if I was in your place playing a, a demo of Cuphead, I would be really nervous because when I'm playing in my house, I'm already dying all the time. So oh, in the... Oh, I was absolutely yeah, I was horrible. I was horrible at it. I, I like, can only I imagine the like... pressure. Yeah, well, yeah, and you're, like, people walking behind you at this convention. Everyone's, like, looking at your screen, like, judging. I'm like, no, 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 like, I I promise I, like, at least kind of know what I'm doing. <laughs> Go back to Animal Crossing, man. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Oh, dude, you don't even know the half of it. I, okay, so I played, like, a good amount of games, and I felt like for a good number of them, maybe it's just the pressure of having people watching, but I was, like, I was playing this puzzle Probably. game at one point, And I just couldn't, I just could not figure it out. And then the <laughs> game developers, the, the developer of the game, she's like sitting right next to me. And I'm gonna turn to her and ask her, I'm like, I'm oh, like that's okay, a... like, and the, yeah, right. <laughs> um, she's probably just wondering, like, sir, you're not actually press, are you? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, no, but, but I, what I was going to ask if uh, the new character in the game, uh, I forgot her name. But Miss uh, Chalice. yeah, Miss yeah. Chalice. is she different to control? Is there anything different in her? Yes, so um, yeah, and that was one thing we talked about too. Um, Maya made very clear that you know, this is not just a simple reskin of Cuphead and Mugman, they totally designed how she moves and plays from the ground up. Um, there's some new abilities, and also you can actually go back with her uh, after you beat the deal, if you beat the main game and you have the DLC, you can actually take Miss Chalice in through the earlier levels in the game. And um, mm. she was saying, like, it's a totally different experience. Um, so it sounds like there's quite a bit to look forward to if you're, like, really deep into this game and trying to, to get the most out of it. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Because it sounds like it's not just DLC, but almost like a gigantic patch that's coming along with yeah. it. Too. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I would go say it like is drastically changing the whole game but you know like they they one of the questions i asked was like did you guys ever consider making this a standalone game and she said you know we talked about it briefly but really like you know miss chalice's story really ties in deeply with the main game and we wanted you to be able to go and take her character and go and re-experience the game with it so that's yeah. why it's launching this way still after all this time um But yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it. And, and uh, they seem very excited for it to come out. They said they're very excited for people to play it. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm super stoked. I mean, I, you know, whether, I mean, I'll probably end up buying it on, on Switch. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll definitely be playing it through, uh, you know, Game Pass as well. I have a physical, well, not a physical copy, but when Cuphead first came out, it was like, you could get a quote unquote physical copy. It didn't have a disc in it, but it came with this uh -huh. beautiful, uh, what was it, like a lithograph, I think. Um, something, uh, but this beautiful art card, just a collection of art cards uh, in it uh, with a digital copy of the game. And uh, yeah, they didn't make too many copies of that, but I was happy to, I was happy to get one of those. It's, a, it's uh, yeah, I love Cuphead. So. <laughs> Uh, that, okay, that was another thing I asked about. I'm glad you brought that up. I did ask um, because, you know, in the past they had said, oh, well, we might release a physical copy of the game when the DLC is done. So I asked, I was like, well, are you guys going to have a physical release come out on Switch? And she said that they can confirm they are planning to do a physical release. They, she didn't say anything more than that. She said they'll have more to share, but that there will be a physical. So That's awesome. That's, that's exciting. That's cool. Yeah, that's super great yeah. to hear. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of the other real big game I played. Um, I, I mean, I did get hands-on with some other stuff that's um, not coming to the Switch. I played a little bit of Street Fighter VI. They didn't have a ton to show with that one. Um, I didn't get to play anything really in the in the open world, um, which was what I was like most interested in. Um, I did get to play this really cool indie game while I was at Summer Games Fest. It's called Glitch Busters, and... Um, It's, it's called Glitch Busters Stuck on You, and it feels very much like a Nintendo game, which is why I wanted to bring, bring it up in this, um, in this showcase. It was one of the first games I played um, at the event, and the best way I can describe this game, and if you're, if you're curious about it, 
and you want to kind of get a sense for like how it plays and see some footage of it, um, there is like a listing on Steam and they have released some trailers. You can go check it out there. But this is a game, it's got a really interesting art style. You're moving through this 3D world as kind of these 2D cell shaded characters. And it's a mix of like shooting and platforming. And you can play through the whole thing single player or you can play through it with some friends um, locally or online. Um, I actually got to play through with one of the developers, uh, which was really cool because I kind of ask questions while we're playing. But what's really interesting about this game is, so there's this magnet mechanic and you use magnets to kind of um, not only like connect to different like objects in the environments, but you can also kind of use it to attract the other players. So like if you're playing with someone, you can like use your magnet ability to like zip over to them and get on top of their head and they can kind of like launch you off somewhere or you know there's a lot of like various little puzzles and things that you do together with people um it was really fun to play it was a huge surprise of the show for me yeah, i'm looking at the i'm looking at footage of it now it looks really slick actually because i didn't even like hear about it until you had mentioned it and um it looks like it could be like a genuine amount of fun like it's it's yeah it looks awesome i mean i'm definitely interested in it now yeah, yeah I, ju um, I, ju I just saw the trailer here too. I think, it, as you said, it, it kind of remembers a Nintendo game in the way that it uses its mechanics. Uh, the one with the magnets looks really fun, and it just looks awesome. Uh, uh, it, is it online or is it uh, just a single player adventure? It has both. Um, oh, okay. They okay. said they said they wanted it to be something that you could play through solo, but they said they also really wanted it to be. A fun like pick up and play experience for for everyone yeah hmm. so so yeah so that was that was kind of a nice surprise um that one does not have a release date yet but um but it looked cool so i just thought i'd mention it um but yeah i just wanted to give a, a huge thank you to summer games fest for inviting nintendo everything out there uh we really appreciate you guys involving a small site like us and um, yeah, it was great, you know, to all the developers that uh, I got to meet over the weekend. Thank you so much for, for talking to me, if you're listening to this. And uh, it was awesome to hear about all these great games that everyone is working on. Um, it's always really cool when you get to meet the people in person who are making these things, you know. You really put a face to these projects. Yeah, and, and it also gives you a chance to really, you know show your appreciation also because i mean it, you know it's one thing to tweet at them or email them or whatever but like when you actually like can like be genuine about it in person i, I think there's a lot more uh, uh merit behind you know those those words and and you can really see them uh the you can see the appreciation reflected uh in their in their face because you know again at the end of the day right like games have not ever been easy to make right so and there's a lot of you know blood, sweat, and tears that usually goes into making the game, making a game regardless of the scope of the project, right? So, right. Uh, yeah, so it's always good to be appreciative regardless if, you know, if a game ends up bad, if it ends up good, regardless, you know, it's just, again, there's people behind it that put a lot of time and effort into it. So, you know, just at the end of the day, it's, it's good to acknowledge that and appreciate them. And, uh, and uh, yeah. Right. Well, and, what, you know, with the pandemic, this was a lot of people's first event in a couple of years. So... Um, that was also a big thing I heard people saying was we're just excited to be out in person and talking with people. So, um, so yeah. So again, thank you to everyone at Summer Games Fest. You guys are awesome, and we had a great time. So, um, all right. So I, I know this is a long episode. We have a few more things to talk about. Thank you to everyone who has been listening this whole time. Uh, we're just going to go through a few quick news topics, and we're going to talk about what we have been playing, and then that will be the episode. Um, so. <laughs> Talking about some news that is not a new game announcement, uh, and who knows if this game will ever see the light of day, uh, because apparently the rumor, going around the rumor mill, so put on your tinfoil hats everyone, uh, there is supposedly a sequel to 1-2 Switch, everyone's favorite Nintendo exclusive, obviously, that has uh, been in development at Nintendo for quite a while. And uh, apparently this game is not in, in good shape. Um, Dennis, do you recall any, uh, were there any details that stood out to you from, from this report about this 1-2 well, Switch sequel? 
I just want to say that I'm literally shaking my head right now, like as you mentioned. <laughs> just the thought of one two switch just makes me angry. I, so, so yeah, the details are, you know, they've been testing it internally for quite some time, and and they're just not getting anywhere with it. It's all incredibly negative, uh, to no one's surprise. And uh, it's, you know, it, I'm not sure why this is something that they feel necessary to make a sequel for. Though that's the thing, because like, did one two switch actually? sell enough to even warrant a sequel and was it even received well enough to even warrant a sequel like genuinely because I, I know it look well we all know it just right. feels about this game <laughs> yeah exactly right so like i mean and look it's just my opinion right i know not everyone's gonna feel that way and if you don't i mean you're wrong but it's <laughs> it's but it but it's was it well received enough where Nintendo's just like, okay, well, I mean, people like this enough where we can sort of make another one? Because to me, and I think to a lot of people, it was a tech demo. And while I, I have played it and I tried it for 20 minutes because that's all you need with it, um, it's cool to see what the Joy-Con can do. But that is it. That is not a game that lasts any longer than 20 minutes or even really needs to. I don't care if you want to call it a party game or what. Now with the wide offering of stuff that we have, like Super Mario Party, uh, you know, and then Fall Guys now come into the switch and just just a wide array of party games you know it, it's just not necessary you don't need a sequel to one two switch just it, it, why this was even brought up is beyond me and then of all the games to get a sequel really you know i'd rather have arms too you know and like yeah, it's just something like, <laughs> hey, that game had some great ideas i would love that <laughs> it did yeah but that's what i mean right it's like there's potential there yeah. even though i don't think that potential was executed very well you know there is potential with the arms brand but with one two switch man like just <laughs> just turn that switch off just stop it. just i'm one, so two, sick switch of it off name of the sequel yeah, switch switch it off. Off. yeah exactly uh, yeah. yeah i'm so sick of it man and I, i'm trying to say this in the nicest way possible because the, otherwise the expletives are going to be thrown around everywhere but yeah it's just it's yeah it's yeah no, i'm good I'm good. Some, <laughs> I'm good. some of the the details, <laughs> I remember I was reading uh, some of the details in the Nintendo Everything sites, and some of the parts I was like, because English is not my main language, so I was like, and I'm reading this right, <laughs> because <laughs> there's this part where he says, uh, Nintendo EPD Group Four designed a host for the mini games based on international appeal, a bipedal horse that looks like a man wearing a Hubber horse mask. The game's text simply referred to him as a horse because it sounded enough like the English word host that would come across in different languages. So it just sounded like this game was total nonsense <laughs> from the beginning yeah, to the end. Right. And it says that some, some of the people that were playtesting did not want to finish the playtest. So, man, I can yeah. only imagine how bad it was. <laughs> yeah, that's brutal. Especially considering how short gameplay sessions are of one yeah, two switch, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's not now, like uh, again, for now. I maintain that it is still to this day. I do believe that it is the best showcase of what the Joy-Con can do, and I'm sad that every time a game says it has HD rumble, it never really feels like it does. It just feels like generic rumble to it, right? Yeah. Because anyone who's used one two switch, the most impressive game mini game in that in that demonstration was uh, was the the one with the marbles. And there's one where you just tilt the Joy-Con and you have to guess how many marbles are in your Joy-Con. And it feels exactly like marbles are in your Joy-Con. It's insane. It's actually insane. And it's just an incredible showcase of the technology that I still have not yet seen to date. And that came out on Switch's launch date back in 2017, right? So, uh, so yeah, the HD Rumble technology is just one of those things that I wish was utilized more, and I don't see why it's not. I mean, I understand it's probably just an extra layer of development that probably, you know, would take a lot of time, but, like, man, when it's utilized well, it's so worth it, and it's amazing to see. But, uh, but yeah, everything just ends up feeling generic, and it's a waste of the technology at the end of the day. It's, it's really sad, truthfully. Yeah. I'm really curious about, I'm reading the original report for this rumor from 1-2-Switch, uh, which came from a writer over at Fanbyte, and, um, you know, they, they are saying that, you know, they verified all this with their sources inside Nintendo, and so I want to believe them, um, and they were saying that um, in some of the game modes that they were testing for this theoretical 1-2-Switch sequel uh, could have up to 100 players in these lobbies. Uh, which is just like I have a hard time even picturing that. I'm like, uh, like a hundred players all milking a cow at once. Like, what what does this look like? <laughs> one cow. <laughs> Imagine. One cow. So they have it's one two battle royale. That's crazy. 
I they mean, said it was called Everybody's uh, One Two Switch at one point, and then it was like kind of inspired by the Jackbox games, Jackbox games. I mean, that's a good um, inspiration, but yeah. it seems that they, yeah. That kind of just seems yeah. like, to some extent, they weren't sure what exactly to do with it, so they kind of started looking around what other people were doing and tried to emulate that without too much success. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it worked for them. I yeah, think uh, well. making some parallels to something that we discussed in a previous podcast about the developments with uh, of Switch Sports, and we saw how crazy they were at some moments of the development, so... Uh, those 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 little tidbits from inside Nintendo give us the impression that those developers really have a lot of uh, freedom to do some crazy stuff. Uh, and of course, a lot of the times it will not work, and I think that's the case here. Uh, but specifically speaking with one to switch, I think I'm on the same page as Dennis. Why at the first place? Why start developing something like this? Yeah, <laughs> There's a lot true. of yeah. other IPs. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think yeah. the main reason behind that is probably just that uh, it's the original sold relatively well. <laughs> Uh, I think it's looking online. It seems like it sold last sales uh, last sales figures are three point four five million copies. Yeah. So yeah, it's not it's nothing. still you know it's not a Mario Party or like a Mario Kart or whatnot, but it's still a very respectable amount of uh, copies. And that was yeah. probably partly due to the fact that you know it was a launch game. People had like nothing else to buy on the Switch. Yeah, it was one of three games um, if I remember correctly. But <laughs> so yeah, I would imagine this was something that that executive saw and were like, hey. People love this. I mean, it sold three million, you know. So yeah. they, they really want a sequel because obviously a sequel is going to sell just as well. Obviously, when given when given no other options, people bought it. So you know, <laughs> and let's put bad. a six dollar price tag. <laughs> oh my god! See, and that's the worst part. You can't get away with that now. That's a scam. Like yeah, they, somebody's yeah. going to sue Nintendo at some point. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's I don't absurd. think it's that bad. It's, <laughs> uh, no, it is. You, you can it make is. It's worse much. than Joy-Con drift. <laughs> you, you could, oh my think, god! That's true. I think you could make a very serious case that One Two Switch has more content in it than Switch Sports does i really think you could that's interesting that would have to take we'll, we'll call digital foundry on that. <laughs> <There you laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll help us they, break it down yeah they would know compare files uh, anyways <laughs> yeah um i don't know if we'll ever see this game um but it's interesting to talk about in theory um hey here's another thing uh people might not see and that's that xenoblade chronicles <laughs> 3 special edition uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so a funny Nintendo, week, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure it's not funny for the people who spent all day on the internet trying to get a copy yeah, of this game. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> for sure. Nicholas, I think you might have something to say about that. Uh, a few choice words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so, so yeah, it, the pre-order for Xenoblade 3 Special Edition happened exclusively through the My Nintendo Store, uh, and to the surprise of no one, it completely crashed and burned <laughs> because they were not ready for the influx of people trying to get the special edition which led to i believe it was 10 hours of ba of like on and off maintenance on the site it going back up people trying to get on it going down it going under maintenance it going back up people getting on it going down for like 10 hours before they finally said hey you know what we'll just reschedule it for another date right which Oh my god, <laughs> it was it was so <laughs> annoying. <laughs> it seems yeah. like they're never ready for stuff like this. It really yeah. truly blows my mind. You know, in in my head, I feel like the thing really what it comes down to is like the people who do marketing at Nintendo and the people who design the website and maintain all that at Nintendo are not the same people. So, you know, no. maybe yeah. the marketing people had a sense for how much people wanted this game, but maybe you know the infrastructure just clearly just was not ready for it. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's not like this is the first time this has happened either, but it's always frustrating when it's something that is going to be a limited edition that, you know, people really want mm -hmm. and are going to have a hard time finding. Yeah, one thing worth pointing out, though, is that the um, the Japanese special editions for the game have been available s since the second trailer, I believe, in April. And the Australian special editions uh, went live at the same time that the North American ones did on uh, June 8th. And neither oh. of those sites have had any problems... Neither of them have crashed, 
Both of them still have stock available, so if you live in Australia or you live in Japan, you can still pick up a special edition right now. Yeah. It's just the American site <laughs> that <laughs> completely floundered and just crashed. I mean, it's uh, because uh, of course uh, I didn't even try to buy it because I live in Brazil and I I, I would I wouldn't even dream at buying a, a special edition that only sells on my Nintendo. But uh, I think the best thing that came out of that story and Nicholas is probably uh, aware of that too because I think he he also is a visitor of the Xenoblade Reddit is the memes because there were a <laughs> lot of great memes in the community. Mario. <laughs> Because the, the, when the error message had uh, a render of Wario, so Wario became like the biggest villain in Xenoblade during that day. And a lot of people <laughs> were making videos, were making memes of Wario. It was it was quite entertaining. Well, he's, but <laughs> he's the main antagonist, right, of the whole series. Yeah. That's where he came from. He's the main antagonist of Xenoblade Three, probably right now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, well, you know, you win some, you lose some. We got the game early, which is great. Yeah. But uh but yeah, you know, maybe just uh the web the website was they just didn't get the memo, I guess. But yeah, it's I think I'm not all you can do forward. is kinda of laugh about it. I'm not looking forward to because I, I was on I was trying to get one for a friend that was going to be at work during the day. Uh so they couldn't really be on the site, so I was just trying to get one for, for them. This wasn't even mm. for mine, so when this happens with the um in Europe with the EU edition, which is probably the one I'm gonna pick up, I don't I'm not looking forward to having to go through all this again. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone oh, yeah. manage to get one? To actually get an yes. order? Oh, uh, I think actually, I there were a handful of people at the very start, I think mostly from Canada for some reason, that were able to pick one up. And then in the middle, there were a few like workarounds that people had found in terms of going to other sections of the site to be able to check out. And so there's a handful of people that got them, just not not many. <laughs> oh, definitely lucky ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I love me a good physical edition of a game. I really don't pick up that many of them though. Like I always like the idea of them because I'm like, oh, that'll look really nice. But then I then yeah. I think about it, and I'm like, oh, that money could go towards a lot of other things though. You know, I, how much does how much is this uh, special edition? Does, it's you know ninety it U.S. dollars. Right, yeah. and you're basically getting like for that, you're basically getting a steel book and an art book. Yes. Right. So yeah, so for me, I'm like uh, forty bucks for a for a steel case, and I mean like, you know, maybe it was for a, a game that I was really excited about at Sporge, but I don't know. It's just it just wasn't getting me excited in the in the way that some physical editions. No, I mean, do. but clearly that's a, lot, a lot of people like it. Yeah. Um, I uh, mean the, I I've bought the special editions for Xenoblade Two and Xenoblade Definitive, so I feel like I'm morally obligated to get the third one. <laughs> <laughs> Right, because what kind of fan are you if you don't? I mean, you know, yeah, fake fan. Right? <laughs> I think uh, what I what I really miss in those special editions is uh, the soundtrack. I don't know yeah. if Xenoblade Two had the soundtrack. I think there was an edition of Xenoblade X that had like a, a pen drive with oh the... a terrible USB. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, and that's the other thing. Like, like, I like. Okay, they'll hype up. Like, oh, we're putting these soundtracks. Which is great, but like, who actually uses a CD player? Oh, I, I that's don't true. Use a CD that's player. True. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so you have these great CDs. Well, you will. You'll use a CD player if you well, have all these Nintendo CDs. No, like, well, no the thing is, that. like, I, it's not so much using a CD player. It's more so just uh, putting the CD into a disc drive so I can download the music from there onto a phone. That way, I don't yeah. have to. If there's not an official like online release of the soundtrack, which there often isn't for Nintendo games. Uh, right. It's just a way of yeah. getting it on there, and still like supporting that, the original that's true. release. Yeah, but. it's like the only way when they had that. But also just because of collection, you know, uh, yes, a beautiful but, CD right. or something like that is always good. Yeah. But anyway, and the right. um, the definitive edition in Europe specifically did come with a vinyl for the game. It's, I don't think it includes Ooh. the entire soundtrack, but that's still you know that's pretty oh, cool. That's oh, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know about yeah, that. That's, that's huge. Awesome. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I pretty much only stream my music nowadays, so I like I love the idea of having all these cool video game vinyls, but I just feel like I would never use them. But hey, more power <laughs> to the people who who use them. Um, all right, well, this has been a long episode. Again, thank you everyone for sticking with us. Uh, there's been a lot to talk about. We got one more thing, and that is what have we been playing this week? 
Uh, Louise, let's start with you. What, do you've, what have you been playing this very busy week in gaming? So, yeah, I've been playing the, mostly the demo for Fire Emblem Three Hopes uh, that just came out recently, this last week. And, sorry, so far I had a very positive uh, experience with the demo. Uh, it's like we are back here to the classic Musou experience. So, for example, if you played Hyrule, Hyrule Age of Calamity, it's not like that. It's more similar to the first Hyrule Warriors, which was more of a, a classic Musou with a Zelda skin. But in this case, we actually have a lot of elements from Fire Emblem, like from Fire Emblem Three Houses. I think a lot of those were already in Fire Emblem Warriors. But when you are playing, seeing the graphics, seeing the characters, it really feels like you are playing Three Houses. Like the whole vibe, the dialogue is pretty similar. And even the way that the story is developing so far, it's really similar. You have to choose your house and all that stuff. And I just think it's a fun time. I like the classic Musou experience because it's not, it's not focused a lot on the actual combat. It's not like a hack and slash, but with the strategy. So you have a lot of characters to control. You can give orders to different characters so you can strategize a lot. And at, at the end of the day, it kind of feels like you are, playing, you are playing Fire Emblem in real time. Like you are still making some decisions, some strategic decisions, but you are actually uh, controlling all the characters in combat in real time. So yeah, I had, had a good time with it. Oh, and the, the performance is fine so far. It was something that, was, that I was a bit, wor a bit worried after, after Age of Calamity because the, the, the performance of that game on Switch was really rough. But no problems with this one yet. It seems to be a, a, a solid 30 FPS, so usually uh, an okay experience. But yeah, uh, I've enjoyed the demo so far. Uh, I tried out the demo as well, and I was super impressed with it. Um, it really feels like a sequel to Three Houses in a lot of ways, where it's yeah. bringing... I love this, this style of Musou game, where it's just... This is a Musou game, but we're taking very heavy inspiration from the, the Source franchise, or the, or the Source game. So it really feels like a a part of the world, and this definitely fits the bill in that regards. And just like you said, in terms of the dialogue, in terms of the cutscenes, um, I would even say like in terms of the story, there's certain. I I was playing through the uh, the uh, Black Eagles, the Edelgard route of the demo, and there's certain parts of that story that uh, I would argue are better than they are in base three oh. houses. <laughs> That's interesting. They're, yeah, it's there's just like certain plot points or things that are addressed that make the story feel more complete. I would definitely say it's something you would want to play after Three Houses, based on my yeah, experience. Yeah, because, I agree. Yeah, there's quite a few spoilers and stuff, but it is a very satisfying um, complement to the base game. That's interesting. Do, did the demo provide like like I know we were talking a little bit about you know a huge part of Fire Emblem game is building the relationships. How deep does that go exactly? Did the demo really delve into that to a significant degree? I think uh, I did not see. I don't know if it has the supports from Fire Emblem. Did you see it in the demo, Nicholas? Um, I saw that there was the option for it. I am close to reaching one support level with one with a pair of characters. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm pretty sure you're th you're able to access it in the demo. I haven't done yeah. all the missions in it, so I think there's still time for me to up that support and see it. I'm pretty sure it would still be in there. I mean, something that I was really impressed is that they are bringing the because in Fire Emblem Three Houses, it's I think I, I think it's the first Fire Emblem game where you can actually explore like Garrick Mac, so you can mm -hmm. like walk in the school and talk to all those characters, and they brought that to the game, so you can actually walk, uh, have conversations with NPCs, and it just uh, the feeling when playing that game is really similar to Three Houses, and I was I was really happy with that because with Age of Calamity sometimes it felt to me like they are trying to emulate Breath of the Wild, but I mean it's like impossible to do that with a Musou and Fire Emblem. I think the style of Fire Emblem fits really well with a uh, with a Warriors game. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I um I you know this game was not. I mean, I'm playing through Fire Emblem Awakening right now for the first time, so that should tell you guys about how much of a Fire Emblem fan I am at the moment. But I'm always very interested in these games. I love the ideas they bring to the table. And, like, you know, it makes sense on paper. Like, okay, yeah, Fire Emblem and Dynasty Warriors, they both got swords, you know, it makes sense. But <laughs> it's all the other stuff that makes Fire Emblem special, you know, all these other mechanics of these relationships with these characters and 
how strategic it is that I was anxious, you know, they'd have a hard time translating into this game. And it sounds like so far they're they're doing it, which is really impressive considering it's totally different developers and a totally different engine and basically made from scratch. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm really glad that it's been so well received so far. Yeah. Um, well, Nicholas, um, other than that demo, what have you been playing this week? <laughs> um, I'm going to get some judgment for this, but... Uh, so I, I managed to actually complete Octopath this week, which I was a little bit surprised Ooh. by. I thought I'd have a, more content left. Uh, but what what was left of the post game, I managed to breeze through pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, I really liked it. Octopath is a fantastic RPG. If you're into kind of older school style RPGs, uh, I cannot recommend it enough. It was super fun. I really hope that we get something else in that world that is not a mobile game one of these days. Um, but yeah, re- just super happy that I finished that. And uh, once I finished that, I kind of had the urge to go back and play Bravely Default. So I started playing that a little bit. <laughs> oh, you're in the rabbit hole now. Oh yeah, uh, RPG rabbit hole. Although to be fair, uh, I was going into Bravely Default with the plan of completing it because I had originally just beaten it. I realized that some of the completion criteria that I was looking at would be way too annoying to do. So I settled for beating a secret boss that I was not aware of was in the game at the time. And so I'm going to say that for now I've completed Bravely Default. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think pro- what I'm probably going to do next is play through the original Fire Emblem Warriors because I only played about halfway through the original at the time. Uh, and I'll try and beat that before uh, Three Hopes comes out. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's fair. No, Octopath Traveler is a big game, so that's it's always a big accomplishment when you beat a big RPG like that. Um, so are you? So you know, you mentioned like there's a prequel coming to uh, smartphones. It's called Octopath Traveler: Champions of the Continent, mm-hmm. and um, you know it's a free to play mobile game. So I know that's going to turn a lot of people off, but you know now that you've finished the main game, are you like even at all interested in something like that? I mean, marginally, but I have several... I mean, aside from the fact that it's a mobile game, I've it's it's a gotcha, which is a little bit off-putting. And I've, I have looked around a bit to see what general impressions are, and it's fine. I've heard conflicting things on whether the gotcha system is good or not. I've also heard that the tone of the story is just generally far, far darker than Octopath, which I, I'm not sure if I'm oh. necessarily going to like. Um... But, I mean, it's interesting. If nothing else, I've looked up some things about the game, and it does provide a good amount of world-building, even providing some context to events that happen in Octopath that aren't necessarily explained super well. So, it has, it definitely has some worth in, from that point of view. I don't know if I would go ahead and uh, try it out, though. I think it's going to have a first Western release sometime this year, but I don't know if I would yes. check that out. Low priority is the vibe I'm getting from you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's if there's fair. a sequel, though, like a true blue Octopath Traveler sequel, I am all in for that. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Right. It, triangle strategy is not in the same universe, right? Just no. similar art and style? Yep. Okay. Uh, same devs, I believe, but it's a different world entirely. Right, right, right. Um, okay. Well, cool. I'm glad you were able to cross that one off your list. Um, Dennis, what have you been playing this last week? Yeah, so the biggest and the biggest one and the main one uh, is uh, the Quarry. The Quarry just came out the other day, uh, created by Supermassive Games, the good folks behind uh, Until Dawn and basically all the Dark Pictures games, right? So House of Ashes and uh, and all those. So, uh, but they're they're great games. If you're not familiar with those games, they're basically just you know choose your own adventure sorts of games. They're very cinematic, um, and yeah, you just kind of go through all all their games are horror games um and you go through these games and you just select choices and there's just a bunch of different endings and paths you can choose and you know everybody can die everybody can live only some can die only some can live and it's it's different every time and i love these sorts of games just because of how dynamic they are and how everybody has their own experience not just with these sorts of games but even the same thing with with the telltale games right like walking dead like batman like like tales of the borderlands where everyone you talk to that plays these games has their own 
experience, the, the, like a tailor-made experience, and everyone is affected differently as well. And so it's always, it makes for an interesting conversation every time you speak with someone who's also played those games, because it's like, okay, well, who, you know, who survived, who didn't, or, you know, in the case of some of the other, some of the Telltale games where that's not really a thing, it's like, oh, well, which paths did you choose, you know, some of the more, uh, you know moral choices and things like that uh it's i just love seeing it all unfold um uh, my girlfriend and i've been playing through that and uh we're, we're a good ways in i'm not sure how much longer we have but we're we're a good ways in and yeah i've just been having an absolute blast with it it's uh basically a bunch of these um probably you know early 20 somethings that all are in this uh they, they work at a sub at a summer camp and they're ready to go home but uh their their car breaks down basically so they have no choice but to stay there uh throughout the night however things start to unravel um and yeah i'm not going to spoil it from there but it's that never it, happens it gets, in horror in horror that, that's really yeah, no no not at all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh no but it's it's fantastic though it, it definitely gives a lot of Friday the, the 13th vibes at least in terms of like you know the whole camp that like sure. atmospherically it's really nothing like friday the 13th but but atmospherically you kind of get a, a similar similar vibe to it but it has the sort of depth and and uh, uh, uh immersion that i would say something like a like a much darker uh netflix series would have you know or something like that so uh right, you know, it, it's right. it, it's a great drama really well written and uh great cast of characters too but yeah that's what i've been playing the core is just fantastic so far i'm uh i would never play a game like that because i don't have the guts to but i'm already watching my favorite streamers playing it and i love to see the different options and the different outcomes uh, i was yeah, already yeah. A, a big fan of until dawn which was pretty similar to this one in the way that they develop the story on that and all that stuff they have a, an amazing way to capture the actors because they are like they take real actors and make all these facial animations and all of that so it looks really yeah. really real but uh it, it's a really fun game to watch there's a, a something funny about it is that they they made a the localization for brazil it's like terrible like really really bad it's like some jokes oh, really? lose total sense but this kind of makes the game really cool to watch because it, it looks like a very trashy movie from the 80s <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of it kind of makes the, the game like a... interesting <laughs> Yeah, but the, that is, isn't that kind of like the vibe they go for? Like, don't they really kind of play up like the, the cheesiness and the the corny yeah. aspects of it? No, they they definitely do. I mean, they even make references to other movies, and you know, and then they're like, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, like, well, you know, this isn't some movie, you know, and stuff like that. Like, they always make they definitely make jokes about uh, existing content and just the situation that they're in. They're very self aware without being entirely. Uh, you know, demeaning or, 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 or you know, just appreciating right. the entire value. So, yeah, no, it, right. it's, they definitely make fun of it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're aware of everything. And so. that, 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 some that. kind of quarry? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 and they, 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 they do the, 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 they do this thing where the characters start really, really dumb, like super dumb. And by the, the end of the game, you're kinda, you kind of love all the characters. Like, they really develop them in a, in a really interesting way. So it is yeah. fun to watch. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I really enjoyed what I played of Until Dawn. I don't know if I ever finished it. I mean to go back and, and actually do that. But, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah definitely. Looks great. Yeah, if you can, yeah, if you can, go back and finish Until Dawn at least. Like, out of all their games, I think Until Dawn is still one of the top tier ones. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, Man of great... Medan was great. That that one I really oh, I loved that a lot. One. Yeah, I liked yeah. that one. Honestly, the weakest one was probably House of Ashes. Uh, the second one, which was, I'm trying to remember, was it Little Hope? Little Hope? Yeah. Uh, that one I liked a lot, too. I would say that one was actually scarier than the first one, but the first one had a better story than the second one, if that makes sense. So, um, but yeah, and then House of Ashes was just too military-focused, and it wasn't that scary, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Well, congrats, Supermassive Games, on the new release. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to check that out at some point. Um, what I've been playing lately, I've been playing quite a bit, but I think the game I want to talk about this week is uh, Watch Dogs Legion. And uh, the reason why I started playing this game recently, it's, it was kind of on my mind because a couple weeks back, I think Watch Dogs 1 came up in conversation. 
And I really loved that game. I really loved um, the tone of that game. And, um, you know, people like to make fun of, like, Aiden Pierce and stuff. And, like, I get it. Like, it's all a little silly. But um, but I, th- I really still think, like, to this day, just the tone of that game was just perfect for what they were trying to do. I and um, so I was really excited when they announced that Watch Dogs Legion was getting this whole expansion with Aiden Pierce. And he's, like, the main protagonist. And they're, like, bringing him back. And I, I really wanted to see what they would do with it. Um, and so I actually tried to jump into that kind of like first before I even really got too far into the main game where you can kind of just play as anyone. Um, and that mode kind of got criticized a lot for just not really having a lot of weight to it. And, um, you know, I just, I was really just kind of disappointed overall, to be frank. I, I really like the idea of like having London as a setting, but I, the whole city just feels very, very lifeless compared to the other Watch Dogs games. Um, there's not really... A lot of a lot of depth to it you know it all looks very similar you're pretty much just doing the same thing over and over again which isn't always bad but um the game really just didn't do a lot to like make you feel powerful in the way that the first watchdogs game did um yeah. you know it's, it's that kind of game where you feel very acutely aware that like you know this is all a very like manufactured world and it's it wasn't a very immersive experience i think in the way that I had really liked about the first game. Um, so Can I, I don't think... you something about... Oh, sure, Legion. sure. Um, so, because, I mean, I, 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 I do own it, but I just, I have yet to get around to playing it. But I, I, I'm with you in that uh, I, I love the original Watch Dogs. I think it is a fantastic game. Um, mind you, I also played it a year and a half after the game originally came out. Not So I, I didn't play the disastrous sort of launch that it had with all the bugs and whatnot. I, I played the version that was all you know fleshed out and polished and whatnot. So, uh-huh. um, But I, I fell in love with it. I thought it was great. Watch Dogs 2 didn't really necessarily have that grip for me. But with Watch Dogs Legion, um, it's interesting that you say the world is lifeless, especially with all the previews that they were showing. Like, oh, look at London. But is there is the story with you being able to literally play as anyone it seems like is there ever any sort of connection that you feel with any character and does the story actually sort of fall apart because there's no real protagonist or anything like that like do you you know what i'm trying to ask I, like, maybe I'm yeah not well, no but. No, I do. I do get what you're saying. And, you know, it's a, it's going to be hard for me to answer because I don't think I'm going to beat this game. Um, I, <laughs> right. like, like, you know, I was, again, I played through this story-driven expansion with Aiden and Wrench, who's from Watch Dogs 2, as the main characters. Yeah. And I didn't think it was very compelling at all from a narrative perspective. And so the idea of going from that to a game where, you know, like, that you know that very much was what people were saying was like oh you know it's very hard to get invested in the stories of these characters and i did play a little bit through with with these kind of you know you you kind of pick you know who you want to be on your team and you know they do a voice acting but it's kind of procedurally done so it doesn't always sound very convincing and i thought the story itself was actually like decent enough it wasn't like the most compelling thing ever um but it hooked me you know to a moderate degree um, but yeah, you know, the big thing for me is like when I'm playing an open world game, I really want to feel that sense of place. And London, it, it's not just that like, you know, when I say drab, I'm not talking, oh, because it's London and it's cloudy and it's rainy. It just, it doesn't feel dynamic really in any way. You know, the, the NPCs don't really feel very um, believable. The design of the world just feels very repetitive and um, shallow. And so I just... I just had a hard time getting into it, which um, is a bummer because I, I really, again, really liked that first game. But yeah. Um, anyways, not trying to be a Debbie Down or anything, but um, but yeah, I, you know, hey, at the very least, like <laughs> I get to take one big game off my list, and that's an extra forty hours I can devote to something. Else, so. <laughs> that is true. That's true. That's that's look. It's beautiful to look on yeah. the bright side of things, right? Like even though. You know, this one's kind of a letdown for you. At least you can put that time and energy towards something that will actually be, you know, worth your while. So, exactly, exactly. Um, honestly, this whole week has mostly been me. Like, I haven't actually gotten to play very many games this week. It's mostly because with all the news and stuff, you know, it's like it yeah. mostly worked this week. But, um, anyways, all right. Well, thank you everyone so much for tuning in to this extra large episode 
episode 12 of Nintendo Everything Refresh. We really, really appreciate all of you guys for continuing to listen in and support us. If you like the show, please spread the word, tell your friends, uh, give us a, a share on the platform of your choice. We are on all these streaming platforms. Uh, we got a video version up on Spotify and here on YouTube as well. Um, and let us know what you think. You can always drop us a comment on YouTube or you can send us an email to our show email, uh, which is in the show notes uh, uh, over on Spotify. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, you guys. We really appreciate it. We will be back at you next week with what is new and exciting in the world of Nintendo.